interesting. Welcome to tonight's program, Objects of Trauma, how the 9-11 Memorial and Museum and Holocaust Museums use objects to teach history. Tonight's program is brought to you in partnership between the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage and 3GNY. Thanks for joining us tonight from wherever in the world you're tuning in from. My name is Emma Snape, and I'm the manager of public programs at the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage. Devoted to diversity and tolerance, the Maltz Museum opened in 2005 in Beechwood, Ohio, with a simple mission, to build bridges of tolerance and understanding by sharing Jewish heritage through the lens of the American experience. Today, the museum is proud to welcome guests to our permanent collection, An American Story, to our Temple to Fareth Israel Gallery of Judaica, and to a special exhibition space. Tonight's program is the final public program supporting our current visiting exhibition, Stories of Survival, Object, Image, Memory. This exhibition is a project of the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center with photography by Jim Lomason, displaying over 60 never before seen personal items brought to America by survivors of the Holocaust and other genocides. Stories of Survival will be on display at the Maltz Museum through Sunday, February 27th, so stop by if you haven't already. If you have any questions for tonight's panel, please feel free to submit your questions by sending them in the chat directly to me, Emma Snape, or through the Q&A function, and I'll collect all of your questions for the panel. But to start us off tonight, I wanted to quickly take a moment and share with all of you um, one of the objects, one of the stories of survival that is currently on display with the Maltz Museum. So what you can see right now is a selection of recipe cards that were given to the collection by Mirsad Kausovic, who was a Bosniak man in Bosnia and Herzegovina. He was interned um, during the Bosnian genocide and he together with some of the other men that he was interned with would write down recipes on whatever they had in an attempt to help themselves feel less hungry. And so um, you can see on this slide, a photo of Mirsad himself, as well as the story that he wrote in his own handwriting on this image telling his own experiences. Um, so I'll take a moment and read that for you before I hand it over to Allison Berg from 3GNY to kick our program off. Things I managed to save from the camp, writing recipes, learning German, cigar holder. For writing, we used aluminum foil and wrappings from cigarette boxes, which we received every second week from the Red Cross. When we didn't have scheduled work detail, we tried to occupy our minds as we whiled away the time inside the barn. Someone came up with the idea to use paper from cigarette box to write culinary recipes. Writing recipes of various dishes, we tried to fool our psyche and our hungry stomachs. While doing so, we imagined eating this food. So I'll just take a moment of quiet until you see this. And then Allison, thank you so much. Hi everyone. And thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. My name is Allison Berg, and I am a board member of 3GNY and the grandchild of two Holocaust survivors. For those hearing about 3GNY for the first time, we're an educational nonprofit formed by third generation descendants of Holocaust survivors, or 3Gs. Our mission is to educate diverse communities about the perils of intolerance and provide a supportive forum for the descendants of survivors. Our Hallmark We Educate or We Do program trains grandchildren of survivors like me to compile and compellingly share our family Holocaust experiences with the next generation in school settings. Studies have shown that students who receive Holocaust education are more tolerant and comfortable with people of different races and backgrounds. They're more willing to challenge incorrect and biased information and are more likely to be upstanders. 3GNY is proud to provide our guest speakers to schools and teachers for free, supported by the generosity of our community. To learn more about 3GNY, see our upcoming webinars, join our mailing list, and support our mission, please visit 3GNY.org. I'll put the link in the chat for your reference in a moment. Artifacts are a big part of how we're encouraged to tell our stories in We Do, and as grandchildren of of Holocaust survivors, we're a living link to the Holocaust. We're a little bit of an artifact in and of ourselves, and it makes our school visits especially impactful for students. In my grandmother's story, I talk about how she buried her golden locket with photos of her parents right before she, the Nazis took her to Auschwitz. I tell students about how after liberation, she returned to her previous home. And while 
other people were living in their house, her possessions and her parents were long gone, she dug up the locket that was still hidden. I reveal it's the same locket that has been hanging around my neck the entire presentation, the same one I'm wearing today. The look of awe on students' faces is one of my favorite moments. I pass around the locket, letting them touch this piece of history. In events of such horrific destruction and trauma, there's a miracle that these fragile, fragile objects could survive. A locket, a photo, a letter. They take on a sense of magic, of hope, and of strength. Things that somehow were not lost even in the darkest of times. And things that we need in order to tell these stories with an eye for a better future. I'm so looking forward to this program tonight to learn more about how professionals use objects to keep history alive. And with that, I am pleased to introduce Dina Bailey. Dina is the CEO of Mountaintop Vision, a consulting firm that generates systemic change within organizations so that they can more positively impact their communities and thus the world. Dina has 15 years of experience in formal and informal education with highlights including her time as the director of museum experiences at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, being the inaugural director of educational strategies at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, serving as the director of methodology and practice at the International Coalition of Sites of Conscious, Conscience, and currently working in close partnership with the Auschwitz Institute for the Prevention of Genocide and Mass Atrocities. Dina is a proud board member of the American Alliance of Museums, Council Secretary for the American Association for State and Local History, and the past chair of AAM's Education Committee. That is a mouthful. Um, so we're so lucky to have you, Dina. Thank you so much, Allison. I always hesitate because every single organization and title are super long. So I appreciate you wading through all of that. Also, many thanks both Emma and Allison for your warm welcomes um, and sharing a little bit about yourselves, as we saw with the recipes and with um, your locket. So I appreciate that spotlight, both for your organizations and for yourselves. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us and sharing space with us today. We look forward to engaging with you as part of this conversation. And uh, very quickly then, just to give a little bit of a heads up, I will first introduce Heather, who will speak for a few minutes. Then I will introduce Alexandra, who will also speak for a few minutes. The three of us will go ahead and talk, and then we'll open it up for some questions. So as you have questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A, and we'll round those up for that last little bit of time. With that being said, let me go ahead and introduce Heather. So Heather is an educator at Pascacock Hills High School in Montvale, New Jersey, where she built and teaches literature of the Holocaust a dual enrollment full year course for upperclassmen. She is a teacher fellow at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and Alfred Lerner fellow through the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous, a teacher consultant for the Drew Writing Project and part of a small cadre of teachers currently revising the curriculum for the New Jersey Commission on Holocaust Education. Heather holds a BA in English and Creative Writing from the George Washington University and an MA in English Education from Teachers College, Columbia University. She is a Doctor of Letters candidate at Drew University, congratulations, and is currently writing her dissertation on the material culture of Holocaust remembrance with a keen focus on artifactual uh, literature. All right, and Heather, please go ahead. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. This program was born as a result of Dave Reckis, executive director of 3GNY, introducing me to Emma and the current special exhibition at the Maltz Museum, Stories of Survival. As conduits of memory and agents of storytelling, the everyday objects on display assume deeper meaning and create compassion and connection with contemporary viewers. One of the most impactful ways in which they do so is through the handwritten responses by survivors or their family members that accompany the artifacts and oversized photographs of them in the museum. When Emma, Alexandra, and I first met to discuss this endeavor, we quickly discovered a mutual thread amongst our respective ordinary, yet quite extraordinary objects. 
their authenticity, humanity, and singularity. Their handwriting. Something so personal and commonplace is quite suggestive and special if you think about it. In fact, consider how much of our individual private archives travel with us throughout all stages of lives. Buried in boxes, tucked away in drawers, kept as keepsakes, we save birthday and holiday cards, letters from old lovers, childhood diaries, college notebooks, autographs, our parents' handwritten address books, and our children's first scribble and a coloring book. These objects can neither be replaced nor replicated and mark a particular moment in time that make them key memory makers and storytellers. What makes them even more remarkable is their ability to speak to all of us, regardless of their original recipients. And tonight we have several to do just that. In addition to being a Holocaust educator, I'm also a third generation Holocaust survivor. And not too long ago, I was bequeathed my Zadie satchel, <clears throat> which is primarily comprised of German typed or Yiddish handwritten documents on fine paper and stacks of black and white photographs featuring unfamiliar faces with no identifying details. With it, I have begun to unpack my legacy, literally and figuratively, piece by delicate piece. I feel proud to be joining the growing body of, body of literature written by grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, much of which can be characterized as quest narratives with talismans as the catalysts for descendants' post-memory journeys. Though the remnants inside my Zadie satchel have not endured trauma, they certainly hold a lot of it. Where we are entering the narrative is at a point when I have just learned my great-grandmother's name contained within a 1965 correspondence my Bubby was having with a lawyer in Berlin regarding reparations for her family's plundered possessions. Mindel Stein, born as Pinchevsky. I vigilantly type in the information on the central database of Shoah victims names on Yad Vashem's website. My great grandmother's life reduced to last maiden name, first name, place, search. This is what I find. Mindel Stein, me Pinchewski, was born in Pietrohov, Trybunalski, Poland. She was an unknown. Prior to World War II, she lived in Pietrohov, Trybunalski, Poland. During the war, she was in Pietrohov, Trybunalski, Poland. Mindel, Mindel was murdered in the Shoah. I look at the page of testimony scanned beneath the speck of information and recognize my Bubby's handwriting. It's fancy yet clumsy curves of letters, as if the English alphabet too speaks Yiddish as its first language. The document itself is in Hebrew, yet another tongue I am lacking, but I can navigate it enough to corroborate the text and detect two more details about this woman, my great grandmother, who as it states, was an unknown. She was born in 1886, no month, and her circumstance of death was Treblinka, no date at all. Hella Stein Reshpsha, the undersigned, declares this information to be correct to the best of her knowledge in Montreal on April 3rd, 1988. I was nine years old, my Bubby's mamala, when she formally declared the murder of her mother. There is one more piece of evidence available in the far right column of the search results page under the heading map. I click on the destination icon and travel to Poland. Two locations are marked the journey between Mendel's life and her death, approximately 250 kilometers from Pietrakov to Treblinka, yet the distance between us is inestimable. I am not the first to claim that I am a foreigner in my own family history. In fact, it seems to be part of the identity bequeathed to grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. So is vociferousness in the face of the silence that suffocated much of our parents' generation. Acts both altruistic and egocentric, we seek not only to fill in the blanks of our ancestry, but also to learn how the questions, fissures and uncertainties give us a greater sense and understanding of ourselves. While the catalyst for these quests is an insatiable desire to concretize the unknown, an inherent byproduct, whether premeditated or consequential, is an ongoing journey towards, towards self-discovery. Called to venture into our familial voids, many of us tenaciously take hold of what we can grasp, fragments both bestowed and hunted, imperceptible and tangible, uncovered and recovered. 
With hopeful, heavy hearts, we search and mourn for a legacy that we will never fully find or stop seeking. For in a quest, the questions are infinite. Just recently, I unearthed a small folded square of loose leaf paper, which had been cut at the bottom two lines down from where the last entry was made. The profound creases divided it evenly into three columns upon opening, revealing Bubby's handwritten Yiddish running across them. I could not decipher a word, a dead end that begins with me. My mother struggled with the page for a different reason. She sent its translation back to me in a PDF file entitled, names of family members. It was handwritten in her meticulous, immaculate, all caps calligraphy on identical blue lined loose leaf paper. The sheet wasn't cut though. She chose to write vertically as if the text had the potential to grow, up, to grow off the page. This is what it said. These are the names of Moishe's family. Mayor, son of David, father. Hana, daughter of Asher Anshul, mother. Mordechai, son of Meir, brother. Beryl, son of Meir, brother. Glima Rivka, daughter of Meir, sister. Razel, daughter of Yaakov, wife. Yaakov, daughter, Yaakov, son of Asher Anshul, uncle. Noha, daughter of Avraham. Gittel, daughter of Yaakov. And then adjacent to those names without a heading. Mindel, daughter of Meir, my dear mother's name. Ariah David, son of Yechaskel Yosef, brother. Malka, daughter of Yechaskel Yosef, sister. Fagel, daughter of Yechaskel Yosef, sister. Hannah Devora, daughter of Yechaskel Yosef, sister. She died in the ghetto. I repeat it aloud as gingerly as its cradled parentheses. She died in the ghetto. Then I utter her name out loud. Hannah Devora, my name. How could it be? How could it never be known that I inherited my Bubby's dead sister's name? How could this detail be omitted when she cradled me in her arms, held me to her chest, gave me my first bath? What else have I been bequeathed without knowing? What else is hidden in this list of faceless names? Can dead ends be resurrected to form new beginnings? Since writing this excerpt, I've revisited this artifact. Now a refreshed set of eyes sees even more. This note appears to be written using two different pens with small changes in font sizes and character, thus suggesting my Bubby wrote this at two distinct times. In the amended script, she defines the family members by relation and notably adds Hana Devora, my namesake to the list. Why did she initially omit her sister's name? How old was Hana Devora when she died in the ghetto? Did she perish of hunger, of typhus? Was her body buried in an unmarked mass grave, the victim of a faceless fate before her sister spared her from total anonymity with the stroke of a pen? I do not believe she was an afterthought. I wonder for whom Bubby wrote this original and then revised note that has come into my care. It is just one of many questions that is met with haunting silence and thus my unsettlement. Yet for all of my unknowing, this small nondescript scrap of paper severed just like my ancestral tree offers a fuller picture by means of one word. Mindel was my Bubby's, my Bubby's dear mother's name. One adjective and the picture is clearer now we sense a deep mother-daughter bond. We feel its embrace, we mourn its loss. From a personal standpoint, it adds a little bit of substance to the void and clarity to my great-grandmother of whom no known photograph exists. It incentivizes me to dig deeper, to hunt further, and to find the next piece of the puzzle to my unresolved legacy. From a universal standpoint, through the lens of a Holocaust educator and historian, it creates a fuller, more personal, personal narrative with which anyone can relate. Tonight, we will be looking at artifacts whose stories and identities evolve and consequently affect not only our understanding of the past, but also our relationship to it. These objects once touched now touch us and carry with them stories of loss and of survival. I'm really looking forward to tonight's experience. Thank you very much for allowing me to share that.
Thank you so much, Heather, for sharing a part of yourself and a part of your family, and also recognizing as we move forward, the power of writing, right? We saw that with the recipes and now with the list of names. So thank you so much for adding to and building on what we've already said. I'm going to introduce Alexandra now. Alexandra has over 15 years of experience in museum collections, archives, and exhibition development at the National September 11th Memorial and Museum and global entertainment giant, Madison Square Garden. As a leader in the museum field, she has spearheaded curatorial initiatives recognized as national models. Since 2017, Alexandra has served on the board of the Museum Association of New York, where she provides professional museum professionals in New York State with advocacy, training, and networking opportunities. Alexandra holds an MA from Bard Graduate Center in Decorative Arts and Design History and a BA from Rutgers University in Art History with a minor in Psychology. She is a published author and international public speaker. Alexandra, welcome. Thank you so much, Dina. And thank you, Heather. That was so moving and, and beautiful. Um, I'm very uh, excited to be here this evening and participating in this wonderful public program. Allow me to share my screen and begin. Um, so, as I prepared for tonight's conversation, I spent quite a bit of time thinking about what makes physical objects of trauma powerful transmitters of history and what happens when these objects are interpreted and laid bare to the natural evolution of public memory within the museum space. We infer a lot of meaning from things, both personally and collectively, particularly when they are connected to episodes of trauma, violence, and conflict. Objects act as unifiers between the living and the deceased, while they often speak to us in a very direct way about suffering and loss, their evasion of destruction can support a survival narrative, transforming these objects of trauma into profound safeguards of human identity. One of the most striking similarities between artifacts of the Holocaust and other genocides, 9-11 and mass casualty disasters is how ordinary these items often are. So many of the personal property items recovered from the 9-11 attack sites were everyday objects like car keys or wallets, jewelry, eyeglasses and ID badges, Items that would have likely passed through the hands of their owners in the hours or even moments leading up to the attacks. Knowing this or even just thinking about it, I believe can spark a very profound connection between the museum visitor and these objects. If that object can be linked to a name or a story at any point in its life cycle, this very fundamental resonance can deepen even more. It can be one reason why this photo of fingerprints on the glass panel of one of the World Trade Center's revolving doors, captured by a photographer in the summer leading up to 9-11, took on new meaning following the terrorist attacks. While we will never know who left these fingerprints behind, they are an unmistakable age old marker of human existence. Traces of our DNA left unassumingly on the surfaces that we casually come in contact with on any given day. Fingerprints also formed the basis of this artwork created in secret during the Holocaust by Josef Scheine while interned at the Buchenwald concentration camp. Each fingerprint belonged to a fellow prisoner, and while their names and fates are unknown, their existence resists erasure 
through the distinct patterns of creases and swirls that form these personal stamps. In 2017, when the National Museum in Krakow displayed this piece at the culmination of their exhibition, Face to Face, Art in Auschwitz, they invited visitors to leave their own fingerprints behind. And this was the result. Even in anonymity, the residue of human presence resonates deeply. But how does our relationship to an object of trauma change or evolve when a name or a face becomes attributed to it? Years after the 9-11 attacks, in an early stage of the museum's collecting efforts, we acquired this handwritten note from a Lower Manhattan Federal Reserve Bank employee who had been handed it on the morning of September 11th by an evacuee running from the debris cloud. The evacuee had encountered the piece of paper on a street outside the World Trade Center before the South Tower collapsed at 9.59 a.m. At first glance, this object could appear unremarkable, a standard piece of eight and a half by 11 inch white paper, likely from a ream of printer sheets common to most any office setting. It bears a message on it, however, a haunting plea handwritten in black ink pen, 84th floor, West office, 12 people trapped. To the immediate left of the message is a small but noticeable smudge. The handwriting is large and legible, but gives the impression that it was hastily scribed. While the paper is creased, it is completely intact. As museum curators and exhibition developers work together to sculpt the narrative threads of what would eventually become the primary historical exhibition through artifacts, archival audio, first person testimony and multimedia. This note came to powerfully represent the chaos and confusion that erupted on the streets of Lower Manhattan on the morning of the 9-11 attacks. In many ways, it stood in for the stories and details from the day that would remain unknown and questions that would likely never be answered. Had the note been plunged to the street through a broken window on the 84th floor from one of the towers? It seemed impossible that we'd ever come to know for sure how it ended up on the street that morning, identify who wrote it, or understand how it entered the sight line of a lower Manhattan evacuee. How it then passed into the hands of someone who safeguarded it for nearly eight years before relinquishing it to the 9-11 Museum added an even deeper layer of unfathomability to the existence of such an ephemeral object and to its provenance. As often tends to be the case, particularly when documenting contemporary historical events as they repercuss, some time needed to pass before further research would reveal more of, to this artifact's story. While 9-11 museum staff prepared for the installation of nearly 800 objects, this note among them, that would populate its inaugural exhibitions. Forensic archeologists at the New York City Medical Examiner's Office tested the smudge adjacent to the hastily scribed message. In July of 2011, it was confirmed that the smudge was a fingerprint of dried blood and subsequent DNA matched it to a 48 year old World Trade Center victim by the name of Randolph Scott. In 2001, Scott was living in Connecticut with his wife and three daughters. On September 11th, he was on the South Tower's 84th floor at Eurobrokers, 
an international brokerage firm. When hijacked United Airlines Flight 175 crashed into the South Tower, it struck between the 77th and 85th floors. Since Scott was in his 84th floor office at the time, directly within the building's impacted zone, his wife Denise had presumed that it was likely that her husband had died instantly. The family was able to find some degree of solace in belief that he may have escaped suffering as a result. When Denise Scott first saw the note in 2011, 10 years after her husband's death, she immediately recognized the handwriting. As she waited until her youngest daughter was out of college to address its existence, one of her daughters remarked, daddy must have been so scared. To which Denise replied, no, your father was hopeful. This note is a fascinating example of an artifact that at first represented 9-11 in the sweeping abstract sense, but later came to speak to a man's attempt to save himself and the people he was with in the moments following the strike on the tower that day. It gives museum curators the ability to not only probe deeper into what transpired within the Twin Towers that morning, but to explore the bold actions that individuals took to try to save themselves and each other. It speaks to the metal, self-possession and generosity that people are capable of exhibiting even when their lives are at stake. And with that in mind, I'd like to conclude with this image of an artwork by Spencer Finch in the 9-11 Museum's Memorial Hall titled Trying to Remember the Color of the Sky that September Morning, it directly speaks to a marker of collective memory in the clear blue sky that defined the day before it went so horribly awry. It does this through nearly 3,000 watercolor squares, each a slightly different shade of blue. The number of squares represents the presumed casualties sustained on 9-11. However, the subtle yet distinct differences in the hue are meant to extract the individual from the abstraction of mass tragedy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Recognizing again, the power, right, that comes from each of these objects and how as we learn more, the objects themselves seem to embody more, right? Sometimes we know the story right off, sometimes we learn more and more, and the story becomes more complex. So I appreciate that you shared that with us, that it is connected again to what Heather was talking about, which was connected to what Allison talked about and to what Emma talked about. All of these objects of trauma are also a part of ourselves, right? That our story changes as we learn more about these objects and the stories behind them. So thank you all for sharing and allowing us just a little bit of knowledge into the objects that you hold dear. I'm going to start with a few questions for Alexandra and for Heather. And then once we get through questions, about 20 minutes or so, we'll go ahead and open it up for questions from our audience. So if you have questions, please feel free to put those in the Q&A. I'm going to start with Alexandra here. And so as we move forward, I'll go back and forth between Alexandra and Heather. Sometimes they might both answer a question, sometimes maybe only one, all right? In the anti-racism work that I do, often with communities, people bring up the Holocaust and the experiences on and surrounding 9-11 as they talk about racialized trauma in the United States. I don't want to focus on the differences tonight. Rather, I'm wondering what you think about these traumatic moments in our history and present that often tie African enslavement, the Holocaust, 
and 9-11 together in people's minds. Right? I know we're just jumping into the deep end, but Alexandra, what do you think it is about these traumatic events that connects people, connects the events together in people's minds? Sure, thank you. Uh, it's such a important and an interesting and layered question that you're you're positing. And um, I guess one thing that ties African enslavement and the Holocaust together in my mind are their intergenerational effects, which are not only psychological, but familial, social, cultural, neurobiological, and, and possibly even genetic. I think that more times than not, we tend to view history in a very compartmentalized way in the sense that if it's historical, that means that it happened in the past and is by all intents and purposes over in our minds. I would argue that this tendency becomes much more pronounced with the way that we view historical traumas, at least within a Western construct and particularly with the way that we view African enslavement and the Holocaust. So while I'm certainly no expert on intergenerational trauma, my personal opinion is that it goes largely unrecognized in our society and that this lack of recognition can hinder progress. Um, even when contemporary acts of anti-Semitic and anti-Black racist violence occur, well, the reaction in the immediate aftermath might be one of collective outrage. I still feel like we look at everything too much in isolation, move on, forget, and repeat. So this is one of the many reasons why I think that the anti-racism work that you do with communities is so critical, Dina. And it's also why I think that when people bring up the Holocaust and their experiences on and surrounding 9-11, um, that by drawing these connections that they're really underlying the necessity of acknowledging and addressing the impacts of generational trauma. And if they continue to go unaddressed, my fear is that shared stress, a term that I recently heard used to describe this feeling that you have um, to manage everything within your own community because you don't know what you'll encounter in society at large, that that shared stress will only increase and, and create more rifts. So as I was kind of thinking a little bit more about this, um, I, I almost want to kind of draw a comparison that I hope isn't too obtuse, but I think that you could look even at the way that we treat veterans in the United States. They come back from war and we just kind of expect, expect them to assimilate really quickly back into society and just, you know, be fine and, and move on. And, and, and I, I feel like, I feel like we do the same thing by not acknowledging the intergenerational effects of the Holocaust, of African enslavement, and we're not, we're not creating space for, for people to be able to, to move forward at least very easily, societally that is. Thank you so much for that, right? The, the intergenerational aspect of it, both the individual as well as the collective aspect, and then bringing in veterans. I think one of the things that has happened, especially over the past couple of years, is that we, um, as a society are using trauma almost flippantly, right? There's this spectrum now and really recognizing that there are these huge moments for very different identity groups, right? Cultural, ethnic, gender, class um, that are experiencing genuine individual and collective trauma and to be aware of those things. Thanks, Alexandra. Heather, I know that you have also thought about this question and we don't have to spend a lot of time, but I don't want to waste your reflection um, without giving you a chance to, to say something if you'd like to add. So please go ahead. Thank you so much. And I just want to say again, I am so looking forward to learning from you and with you this evening. Um, I do think that there's a tendency in our society to compare traumas 
which is the antithesis of any sound pedagogical approach to teaching history. And that was really what I was thinking about as I was mulling over this question. Um, and in her recent book, Anti-Semitism Here and Now, Deborah Lipstadt writes something in the introduction that I actually share with my students early on in the school year. She says, the existence of prejudice in any of its forms is a threat to all those who value an inclusive, democratic, and multicultural society. When expressions of contempt for one group become normative, it is virtually inevitable that similar hatred will be directed at other groups. Like a fire set by an arsonist, passionate hatred and conspiratorial worldviews reach well beyond their intended target. I think what unites a lot of these traumatic events in our minds is that they are the product of people and that nobody is immune from any of these isms. Those who are stigmatized, marginalized, displaced, victimized, dehumanized, they are all human beings. They are fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers and friends and classmates and neighbors. And I think that that's one reason why tonight's discussion is so important. Objects and especially the mundane ones transcend race, class, time, and space. What ties these events together are that they are human history, not solely to be owned by the traumatized group. Um, you know, that's kind of what I was really thinking about is this idea I, I tell my students all the time, you know, the, the Holocaust isn't just Jewish history, it's human history. And um, again, I think it's the, the objects that, as the common denominator that can tell the stories. Yeah. Thank you, Heather. And I want to focus in on something that you've said a couple of times now, which is in talking about the objects uh, you referenced, especially, I think, the mundane ones. And so as we're thinking about objects of trauma, sometimes they're striking um, because of their simplicity or their everyday aspect. Sometimes they're more familiar or less familiar. Sometimes they're beautiful, sometimes they're harsh. So when you're thinking about yourself, certainly, and your students, what are the objects that you've noted to be especially striking? And why do you think that is? The ones with which we can all relate, the most human ones. I tell my students at the beginning of the year that we're all going to have these moments of connection. And sometimes they're going to completely catch us by surprise. Sometimes it's when we look at a photograph of siblings sitting out, sitting starving in the Warsaw ghetto. And we think about our own siblings in that moment. Sometimes it's when we see a picture of human hair um, very early on in the year, I actually try to set it up by focusing on objects in a variety of ways. And if I could share my screen, um, it's been really wonderful actually collaborating with Alexandra for quite a while um, on learning about some of the stories behind objects in the, at the 9-11 Memorial Museum. Um, so it's very interesting. My seniors were born in 2003 and 2004. So even something as immediate to us as 9-11 is somewhat distant and foreign to them. And so I'm at a point now where I can show this picture on September 10th or September 11th in the classroom, and they won't even immediately make any kind of connection to it. So at the onset of the school year, again, it was September 10th or 11th, I projected this image and I started with a let's write. I asked students to tell the biography of this object. And so they wrote for a few minutes and I asked them to whom did the shoe belong? What can we discern about their owner? What story does the shoe tell? How do you know? And their observations were profound, thought provoking, insightful, and certainly very specific. They commented on the sole of the shoe, the fact that there were some markings on it, but also a watermark that suggested that it was fine leather. They looked at the leather around it, imagined a businesswoman, imagined that she was perhaps affluent. So we engaged in a conversation about it. And after we looked at this picture for a while, um, I actually shared with them Alexandra's essay from a book, 9-11 uh, Objects, The Stories They Tell about Michelle Martucci's shoes. And so now all of a sudden after reading the story, 
the shoes had a face. They had a name. And one of the great reasons why shoes are so awesome to talk about is because there's a literal and a figurative meaning behind it, really getting to the concept of empathy. Um, one student said, I asked them, how does Michelle's story impact your connection, connection with this pair of shoes? And he wrote, Michelle's story allows me to bear witness and makes the whole situation more personal. So after we spent some time with that, I showed them this picture of this shoe, which I took when I was in Auschwitz. And I asked them to tell the story of this shoe. So they spent some time with it. I asked them to look at all four corners of the picture. They noticed its size. Some questioned why there was only one. And in the end, we saw a little girl, but I told them that this shoe didn't have any kind of identity whatsoever, no name ascribed to it. And that oftentimes when we look at Holocaust objects, there's the absence of the story. We're looking into the void and we have to sit uncomfortably with that as we create our own narratives. Imagine how powerful this story would be or this object would be if there was a picture of a young girl next to it, perhaps associated with a name or a drawing, but we don't have that here. And so I think oftentimes the most powerful objects in the classroom are ones when we can get more of a comprehensive story, whether it's presented to us or we make it up ourselves. Thank you, Heather. And I want to recognize again, the connection between what you and Alexandra have said in that stories evolve, right? Sometimes we don't know the story. Sometimes we learn more about the story. And I'm so glad, Heather, that you brought up Alexandra's article. Alexandra, I'm going to turn to you here. In thinking about the responsibility that we hold, right, as educators, as curators, as holders of these objects and the stories. Um, so we are the vehicles to tell the stories of these objects of trauma. Would you just take a moment to talk about what you think our responsibility is and how your perspective has or hasn't changed uh, throughout your career? Sure. Well, of course, I could speak to this, but really only from the perspective of a museum curator. Um, it's I don't even know where, really where to begin. Uh, <laughs> I, I definitely feel that throughout my tenure at the 9-11 Museum, it was um, always a little bit difficult for me to feel completely confident that people were ready to part with these very personal items. Um, I remember meeting with the large family, a large Irish family of a firefighter who was killed on 9-11 and they presented me with the very, very crushed helmet, which was the only item that was recovered um, tied to that particular individual. And it was just extremely, extremely emotional. And those experiences were there were many experiences like that throughout my nearly 13 year tenure collecting these artifacts, not only from victims' families, but from survivors in the example of Michelle Martoshi's shoes, and um, also from responders, some of whom were suffering with health effects as a result of their exposure to the toxins at ground zero. And seeing that thread of, uh, of the 9-11 story kind of playing out in real time was, was very, very hard. Um, I was heartened to meet a scholar from FIT by the name of Brenda Cowan, who conducted some research about the therapeutic effects of objects. And she was particularly interested in focusing on you know, what happens to a person when they divest themselves of an object of trauma to a public repository. So when somebody decides, makes the decision to give something so deeply personal to a place that they know will care for it in perpetuity, whether or not that object goes on display, they know that the story will always be 
kept and, and preserved in that, in that space. And what her research yielded was really affirming for me, you know, moving forward in my curatorial career, because she did in fact demonstrate through interviews and not only with members of the 9-11 community, um, but she went to other locations around the world and spoke to um, groups of individuals who had donated objects of trauma in other contexts. And she was able to, to say that, yes, there is a, there is a therapeutic effect to, to divesting oneself of this material item and giving it to a place where you know it's going to be cared for. So um, having that in mind moving forward really bolstered my confidence as a curator because it was always something that I um, felt very, very self-conscious of throughout my work. Did people feel pressure to give to the 9-11 Museum? Did they feel that their loved one wouldn't be adequately represented if they uh, didn't participate in this public initiative? So um, I, I was just very heartened to have that, that deepened understanding that it's more than just representing your loved one in in the context of the museum and at that site it's it's about it's about this moving through moving through your grief i love that i love moving through your grief um i just want to hold on to that for a second and while folks are thinking about that right i would remind you to please put things in the Q&A. If you have a question, happy to read those out for you. While folks are thinking of their questions and, and just sitting with what Alexandra said, I want to turn back to Heather. Right? And Heather, as we're talking about this idea of releasing, right, whether it will be displayed or not, and the responsibility that curators in particular have, I want to ask if there's anything you would like to add about holding on to or releasing objects, right? I recognize that this comes both from a personal history as well as from your professional work. So is there anything you'd like to add about holding on to or releasing objects? You know, I'm really stuck on the verb moving. Um, one of the qualities of third generation Holocaust literature that I'm looking at right now is again, as I said earlier, this, this quest narrative where it's a process of encountering an object, trying to make sense of it, putting together pieces of the story, moving on but never fully moving on and always kind of cycling back to it as well. Um, in fact, even just thinking about that image I, I tell students all about that, you know, throughout the entire year is that we're always kind of taking one step forward, but reflecting and moving back as well. And so I guess what I want to offer right now is, is that image of the cycle and that uh, there's forward movement, but again, always a look to the past and to ourselves as well. Yeah, I like that idea of movement and also, again, sort of the individual and collective nature of both of those aspects, right? As we're thinking about um, moving, how it is relational. And both of you have talked about that relationship too. So I guess the next question that I want to ask, and probably I'll, I'll ask both of you, um, but Alexandra, I'm gonna start with you this time, is to think about um, how museums and potentially classrooms and uh, community members are leaning into co-creation, collaboration, partnerships. So when you are thinking about schools and museums and communities, uh, how would you like to see them working more closely together through these cycles and this movement. Oh, you're on mute, Alexandra. Oh my God, classic Zoom error. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I think that 
I, I would definitely like to see more increased community involvement with, with museums. Um, one of the things that we were working on a lot at the 9-11 Memorial was really trying to begin to engage um, some more marginalized communities, um, undocumented immigrants, for example, um, and really work on making a space where individuals feel comfortable to come forward and share their story in whatever capacity, whether that's through an oral history or through the donation of a physical object reflective of their experience or their loved one. Um, I think that there are endless opportunities to do that in museum settings and kind of just thinking about ways to be coming from, again, a curatorial and a collections perspective. I had the ability to really sit with the 9-11 Museum's collection throughout my career there and to understand, you know, where some of the gaps in the narrative were and talk about that with my colleagues and think about ways that we could begin to, to close some of those narrative gaps and um, how we wanted to reach out to various communities in a very sensitive way and partner with community leaders to bring awareness to the museum's initiatives. I think sometimes it's just about getting word out that the museum is interested in collecting your story. And that, you know, it could be that simple, that just that, that, that simple recognition um, will open up doors for bringing in new voices and, and collecting uh, new experiences. So um, it's definitely something that we were, we were heavily involved in, and um, I know that the museum continues to do. So um, luckily, I mean, it's, 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 it's a challenge, even at the 9-11 Museum, which is documenting a very contemporary event. Still, you are dealing with a global community impacted by the attacks. So um, just kind of really being strategic about thinking about how you want to connect with those various global communities and really finding a person or multiple people, ideally, who could be touchstones for you within those communities, you know, wherever they may reside. But, you know, having a closeness to the collection in particular and the stories really enabled me to be able to think about, you know, kind of where to go next in terms of, of building the, the collection and, and bringing in more stories and then working with my colleagues to think about how we can meaningfully introduce those stories and those new voices into the greater narrative in the museum. Yeah, thank you for sharing that from your side, right, from the internal perspective of the museum. As we're thinking about what more community involvement or more community engagement looks like, right? There's a lot of nuance and complexity and, and bureaucracy and things that go along with that. Uh, Heather, from your perspective, right? You are a teacher fellow with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, you have other fellowships as well, right? You are um, an educator. And so from your perspective, what would more community involvement with museums mean or look like? I think that, you know, when I was thinking about this question earlier today as well, um, perhaps as a result of the pandemic too, I think, you know, we've turned so much to what's digital and what's online and archived in order for us to bring the museums to us in some kind of ways. Um, you know, when we go to a museum, um, oftentimes we're there for a full day, half a day, and it's both an individual and a collective experience. We're standing next to other people as we're individually, you know, interacting with these artifacts and these stories. It's very personal and you could spend a lot more time with them when you're doing it in the comfort of a classroom or at home. 
Um, you know, I had the privilege of walking around the 9-11 Memorial Museum with Alexandra years ago at this point. I remember when you and I first met and I remember standing by Michelle Martucci's shoes. And when we were there, Alexandra, do you want to just tell that small story? Yes, uh, thank <laughs> you. I'd love to. Um, yeah, I mean, to, to Heather's point about how, um, how profound connections to these mundane objects can be. Um, I had an experience during my tenure at the museum where I was um, showing a few images in a PowerPoint presentation and of the images Michelle Martucci's shoes were included. And I was speaking to a high ranking military official who was very quiet and stoic throughout the entire presentation. And when he saw the image of Michelle's shoes, he took a moment of pause and he said, my wife has a pair of shoes just like those. And so Alex told me that story when I was standing in front of those shoes. And um, what I strive to do is to bring that level of connection and humanity in the classroom by layering all of you know, um, the different artifacts and stories and images. You know, I feel it would be great if we could have Alexandra come in every day and talk in such great compassionate detail about um, so many of these artifacts. But it's kind of exciting when we could think about our teens, today's youth, students of the Holocaust, starting to put together pieces of the puzzle as well. You know, if I could share one thing, a word that I keep on writing over and over again is layering. And I think it just really, tonight when Allison was telling her story, I immediately thought of Ellie Wiesel's short story, The Watch. And that's actually a whole other part of this that we haven't really even had the chance to talk about. Um, there's a lot of object heavy literature out there as well. And I believe that the objects there quietly but clearly speak as bearers of witness as well. And so I was just imagining earlier, Allison, I'd be so honored, right, if you came into the classroom after we read The Watch and then students put those two in conversation and The Watch came that much more to life. Or in a poem, Maidonic by Elizabeth Spaulding that we read in the classroom, at the end, the speaker says, what kind of woman would wear high-heeled sandals to a death camp? I realized my mother and then I understood and wept. And so um, looking at an image, hearing a story, reading a testimony or a memoir and then poetry, I think that we can layer all of these different types of texts in order to create a fuller picture and thus create more empathy and connection. That's really, I think, what it's all about, right? For me personally, is that it's about building connections, practicing empathy, creating opportunities for people to learn about themselves and learn about each other, right? We as human beings, as a collective. And so as we think about community engagement and Museums, as we think about objects and stories or narratives, I think that it's so important, right, to not hold those separate, not keep objects over here and stories over here and people over there, but that we open up space to tie all of those together. And so I guess my last question for you all is really thinking about um, what you want to share forward, right? Is there anything else that you've been reflecting on that's been on your heart that you want to make sure that people think about um, tonight, tomorrow, when they watch this recording, you know, a year from now? Is there something that you want folks to think about in connection with objects and trauma and stories? And uh, Alexandra, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, I, I guess I really, 
it's all it all boils down to the stories for me in whatever form they may take and i think that i mean as we've really i feel illustrated and a point that we all keep on kind of reverting to this evening is we all have different points of connection and a different inroad into connecting with a massive event. And I think that when you're looking at photographs and, and you're listening to audio and there are digital artifacts in the same space where there are physical ones, the beauty of museums to me will always lie in the fact that a lot of interpretation can be drawn from putting objects, whether digital or physical, in dialogue with one another. And this was really something that we strove to do at the 9-11 Museum. And one of the most impactful experiences that I had collecting a digital artifact revolved around archiving a personal blog that belonged to a young 9-11 victim named Avnish Patel. And his blog had photographs that he took on various trips um, around the world with his family, with his friends, and even had some photographs that he had taken from his World Trade Center office floor. And he was so proud to work in the World Trade Center. And it was such a great early example of someone sharing a little piece of themselves on, on the internet back in 2001. And we archived this website for the 9-11 Museum's collection. And uh, years after we did that, Avnish's brother called up one of my colleagues in, in a bit of a panic and said, you know, the website's gone. It just, you know, it just disappeared. The URL is no longer in existence. I mean, it was like this digital human remain had been wiped, you know, off of, off of the internet. And we were able to pull up the archive pages of Avnish's blog and, and share that with, with his brother. And, you know, it's interesting to kind of think about that blog and what it represents about this individual, because we also have a physical artifact in the 9-11 Museum tied to Avnish as well. And that's a piece of paper with his letterhead that flew out of the Trade Center when the buildings collapsed on 9-11 and landed on the rooftop of somebody's Tribeca apartment. And um, when that person stepped out onto the roof, they collected it and they saved it and then donated it to the 9-11 Museum years later. And we were able to make the connection with this digital blog and, you know, kind of thinking about those two artifacts together and what a museum collection is able to do in terms of painting a portrait of, of someone, of a life lived, is really profound to me. So, you know, I hope that people kind of think about that you know, the next time that they're in a museum space, of course, you know, where you're standing matters, especially at the 9-11 Museum, you're at the site of trauma itself. And that is hugely, hugely impactful and really sets the tone of the experience completely. But, you know, when, within, when you're within that space and you're looking at objects in whatever form they may take, physical or digital, audio or not, they're all conversing with one another in, in one way or another. And everything down to the way that they're lit and mounted and in a case or not in a case, all of these decisions as subtle as they may seem uh, contribute to storytelling and, and richness and, and fostering connection. So I guess that's, that's kind of what I'll, I'll end with this evening. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Heather, I want to make sure that you also have a moment to share. I know we're close Absolutely. to time here, but Thank go you. ahead. It's such a sensory experience. 
Um, you know, my mind was going in so many different dis- directions as you were talking, Alexandra. Um, it, you're creating a narrative. It's a curatorial construct within the museum. It's telling its own type of story. Um, and, and it's so interesting to really kind of get behind the scenes and think about all of the decisions that are made in creating that from the lighting to the placement to how a museum goer even moves around. And it's something that I'm really interested in learning more about. You know, again, I tend to go into the literary or the pedagogical or even the personal. Um, One thing that you said that really kind of made me think as well is, is the site of trauma. And I really believe that my interest in the material culture of Holocaust remembrance was born when I went to Poland and I was in Auschwitz and Maidanek and Treblinka, which is where my family was murdered. Um, There is a sacredness of that space that has its own communicative powers. Absolutely. Um, I'm grateful that I'm able to bring so much of that into the classroom as well through, again, storytelling and photos, um, through bark on a tree that was in the Lopochovo forest near a mass grave where students can actually still smell all of these years later, the fresh pine. Um, Anything that allows us to feel, to see, to touch, I think is so important. Um, Oftentimes when we read something in class, I say, I want you to read this with your mind as much as with your heart. And I think that as we approach all of these historical events that we were talking about tonight, anything that's traumatic, both on a personal and on a universal scale, it's so important that we approach it with both. Um, And clearly it's, we're trying to disseminate that as much as possible. Thank you, Heather our minds and our hearts. And I think that what both of you have said, Alexandra and Heather together, thinking about that individual aspect, and I would say even the call to action, right? To think about the objects that we hold in our own homes, whether we directly think that they are linked to a traumatic moment in our lives or are part of a collective experience, right? Again, like the Holocaust or 9-11, how do we think about releasing those or what does it mean to hold on to them? How do we search, right? Detective search for more of the story How do we think about it evolving and how our stories evolve because we have come into contact or we are holding on to those objects? And so I thank you so much for not only talking about objects of trauma, but really talking about people and their lives and their names and their stories and for sharing that with all of us. So thank you so much, Heather. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, Allison and Emma, for making this possible. Emma, I will turn it over to you for our final words here. Wow. Thank you, Alexandra, Dina, and Heather, so much for tonight's discussion. I know I was touched by so many of the stories and experiences shared tonight, and goodness knows, I certainly learned a lot as a museum professional. So I hope everybody in our audience was similarly touched tonight. Um, It's been a genuine delight working with all three of you on this program and our discussion of objects and the people who live behind them. So I am so glad that we were able to collaborate to bring this program to life. And before we go, I also wanna take a moment and give a big, big, big thank you to everybody in our audience who turned in from home tonight. You're the reason why the Maltz Museum continues to offer programming. And we are so glad that you spent your Thursday evening with us. On behalf of the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage and 3GNY, Thank you for being here with us to learn together tonight and have a wonderful rest of your Thursday. Take care.